are very welcome to this brief introduction to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 37 through 47. Most of our comments can be downloaded in a document by the link provided below. Although chapter 2 provides fodder for many kinds of theological debates, we shall be more concerned with practical application to helping your church grow and multiply. Let's get into it. Everyone's outline of the book of Acts is different from every other, and it is the same with mine. For our purposes, we are looking at the book of Acts as consisting of seven movements, beginning with Jesus' promise of power for witness to the nations. In this chapter, we are looking at the apostles' witness in Jerusalem and Judea, and in particular, at their planting of new churches in the city of Jerusalem. Today, our attention is drawn to 21 action verbs found in the following verses, which we have divided into seven commands of Jesus for evangelism, seven commands for discipleship, and seven commands for body life. So, let's look at the apostles, how they planted the church in Jerusalem. To begin with, I would like to pose this query. What means or methods did Jesus specify when he ordered his apostles to make disciples in every nation? Of course, we're thinking of the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 28, when he said to go teach them to follow all that I commanded you. I believe that the apostles were doing exactly that as they planted new churches in the city of Jerusalem. So my thesis for this text is the following. The apostles made disciples within new little churches. Multiplication of tiny churches remains the single best way of making disciples in every human society. So let's look at seven commands of Jesus for evangelism as the apostles implemented these on the day of Pentecost. We begin by reading verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what are we to do? Let me raise another query. What must we Christians do in order to bring others under conviction of their need to be saved. I recommend that you look up and read Acts chapter 10, verses 42 and 43. In verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. There is a lot of theological debate over the meaning of repentance. The word itself had a classical meaning, which was to change one's mind, the biblical meaning you can find in the downloadable notes. We would like to point out that in verse... 38, the grammar is quite interesting. The command to repent is in the plural. You, all of you, repent. But then, be baptized is singular. Let each one of you go get baptized or baptize himself, and the result of this will be the forgiveness of your sins in the plural. The Jewish mode of baptism was one of self-baptism in the pools called mikvah. The Greek grammar around the verb to baptize is interesting. First of all, it is a middle or passive voice verb, meaning something you do for yourself or do to yourself. The verb is often accompanied by certain prepositions, such as, be baptized unto you. There are two major meanings or usages of this preposition. It can point to a result, such as forgiveness, or to become one body, 
or it can point to the one with whom you identify by being baptized. For example, Israelites were baptized unto Moses, Christians are baptized unto Christ. The proposition in always points to the medium, that is, in what you are baptized, whether water as a ceremony or the spirit as conversion. The preposition upon, or epi in Greek, points to the authority by which you are being baptized or getting baptized. In this case, the authority is the name, the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord Jesus. In a few texts, they can use the preposition over, per, when Christians were mistakenly trying to get baptized on behalf of the dead. And occasionally, the verb occurs with the preposition by, hupo, pointing to the one who is approving, administering, or is present during the baptism. For example, John the Baptist or Jesus Christ baptizing you with his Holy Spirit. Some of you will notice that those who were baptized that day were immediately added to the church, and there was no delay of baptism following days or weeks of instruction. But I can safely say, after talking with Christian workers and missionaries in many countries, that nine of ten of those whom you will baptize immediately after profession of faith will remain faithful to Christ. How were they able to baptize 3,000 in the city of Jerusalem on one day? Scott McKnight notes that along that path from Siloam to the temple, and especially along the southern slope of the temple, were as many as 500 mikvaot, baptismals. From the text, please reply to this query. What are two immediate benefits for those who repent and get baptized by calling upon Jesus' name? And secondly, what was that gift of the Holy Spirit? There are four major theories. Some say that the gift is personal forgiveness, new life, or salvation. Others say you are brought into union with Christ or with the church. A few suggest that the gift is ability to speak in a non-learned language. Grammatically, this is a genitive of apposition, meaning the Holy Spirit is himself the gift that God gives. Was repentance only for Jews and faith alone for Gentiles? See the response in the downloaded document. Be very sure that you can reply biblically to this query. Who received the Holy Spirit? In the book of Acts, there are three communities who are baptized in the Holy Spirit. After the Jews, there will be Gentiles, and finally, John's disciples. Verses 40 and 41 read, And with many other words, he, Peter, solemnly testified and kept on urging them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls or persons. Seriously, how would we make disciples of 3,000 new believers? Well, in the same way that the apostles did so. See the downloadable document. Bible scholars have commented that the action verbs in verses 37 through 41 each corresponds to a specific commandment that Jesus had given to his apostles. You may download a document listing out those commandments by another link given below. When teaching this passage, have learners form small discussion groups and reply to this query. What are seven commandments from Jesus that are implemented in verses 37 through 41? After three minutes, have each group report on what they learned. Moving on then, we come to seven other commands of Jesus that relate to the making of disciples of new believers. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 
everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. The grammar of verse 43 in Greek is kind of interesting. It actually reads, came fear upon them, and signs through the apostles came, using the same verb for came in poetic parallel. This suggests that where there is profound respect for God, there he performs miracles. Again, have learners form small groups. Have each group reply to this query. What are seven commandments from Jesus that are implemented in verses 42 and 43? After about three minutes, let each group report on one thing that they found until they have found all seven. And all the believers were together and had all things in common, and they would sell their property and possessions and share them with all, to the extent that anyone had need. This may be the only verse in the Bible that calls Christians believers. Otherwise, they are typically called disciples or saints. You may wish to discuss together, were the early Christians practicing socialism? communism, or what? And then, since they were all Jewish and would not disobey the Torah, what did the Torah forbid their selling off? Thirdly, we look at seven commands of Jesus for Christian body life, that is, how churches live together. We note that the verbs continuing and breaking bread are identical to those in verse 42 and have the same meaning here. So, what were they doing at the temple? What they were not doing was holding church services, which did not become a temple activity until about the fourth century by Roman imperial decree. See the notes in the downloadable document. Again, what are seven commandments from Jesus that are implemented in verses 42 through 43? What are seven commandments from Jesus that are implemented in verses 44 through 47? Again, have small groups look at the passage together and reply to this query. Our final sentence in verse 47 reads, And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And perhaps the most important query that we could pose from this text of Scripture is the following. If we, together, implemented these commandments from Jesus, then what could we reasonably expect the Lord to do in our midst? It is my conviction, after studying Scripture, implementing these Scriptures in many countries, and talking with God's workers from many backgrounds, the implementing of these 21 commandments of Jesus nearly always result in the Lord adding to their numbers daily those whom he is bringing to salvation. If we want to see the same kinds of outcomes, then we together must discuss and implement culturally sensitive ways in which to obey all 21 of these commandments of Jesus. If we will do so, then we will see the same kinds of outcomes.